what is it? What is it like? Um, it's... I don't know what it is. It's like we think we all know the story. And, you know, in so many ways, we do. But her words, I don't know, they change it. They change it for me somehow. They. It's like they make her more human somehow. Yeah. More human is what I think it is. Am I happy in life? Um... Uh... Let's see. I hope I'm finding happiness. Uh, if I can realize certain things in my work, I come the closest to being happy. And I can say that also about my life. I have always had a pride in the fact that I was my own. I started one of those searches you do on Google, you know. I don't know what I was typing in, why is the, I don't know, could have been anything, why is the sky so blue, maybe, is what I was typing in. And I came across on the list of most asked questions on Google, why is Marilyn Monroe so famous? Interesting, I thought. And then I wondered, I wondered about this never-ending obsession with her. And what my thoughts on it were and what what is it about that continued obsession with the tragedy of her life? Is it how complex she was as a person? Is it the complexity that we all love in true crime? People we see as one thing who turn out to be something else? Or is it maybe, maybe, is she so famous because ultimately we love happiness? But we also love tragedy, and we love scandal, and we love nothing more than an unfinished ending. I wrap a lot of my stories up in a bow, but actually, what we're talking about here can never be wrapped up in a bow. In 1952, there is images of Marilyn Monroe winning Best New Female at the Look Magazine Awards. And she is so bright-eyed. Her eyes are huge. So full of love. And she hasn't yet developed that breathy voice. And she's not poised to look perfect. She looks young and a little bit scared. Compare that moment to exactly 10 years later. She'd be in her mid-30s days away from death, media shy and terrified of being seen without perfect hair or makeup. She was hardened, she was bitter and broken and she gave her final interview. Welcome to Extraordinary Stories Podcast. Who the hell does she think she is? Marilyn Monroe? Who the hell does she think she is? Marilyn Monroe? 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 Hey, how are you? Are you well? Are you good? I am. Okay, there's words you're going to hear in this episode that are directly spoken by Marilyn Monroe, but not spoken by me. Oh no. Spoken by some of the wonderful listeners to Extraordinary Stories, a podcast. Are you ready? Okay, let's go. Norma Jean Mortensen arrived in the world in 1926. Her mother Gladys was a dancer and she worked as a cutter for some Hollywood studios. So a cutter, you probably know this, but a cutter within 
The film studios would be the person who helps to splice together the film and make it into a, a seamless piece of cinema. Now, obviously, these days we have the technology, but in the days that Gladys was doing it, in 1926, it was a manual job. And quite a, quite a high-pressure job. I mean, you had to really physically cut negative of the film and join it together perfectly. So, Gladys, right, well, she'd had a bit of a turbulent life. She had been married twice by 1926. She'd been married to a Mr Baker and a Mr Mortensen. However, both of these had ended in divorce. Even worse for Gladys was that she had had two children with Mr Baker, a son and a daughter. Um, the son was called Robert, but went by the name of Jackie. I mean, of course, because, you know, in the old days, nobody really went by the real name. <laughs> um, <laughs> so she had, yep, yeah, she had the son, Robert, who went by the name of Jackie, and she had a daughter called Bernice. Now, her marriage to Mr. Baker, well, it was miserable. He accused her of not caring correctly for her children. Their Their son, Jackie, he didn't keep particularly well. His health wasn't very strong. And in his early childhood, there'd just been a series of mishaps, really, um, during an argument where Gladys and Mr Baker were fighting, it got really heated, a glass got smashed, and the toddler Jackie picked up a piece of broken glass and put it into his eye, which, luckily, they were able to save. During another argument, this time in a moving car, uh, the toddler fell out onto the road while Gladys and Mr Baker were too busy arguing to pay attention. Ultimately, really what it led to is that when they divorced, Mr Baker kidnapped the children. He took them and he moved to another state far away from Gladys and overnight she lost her children. Sadly, Jackie, the son, he didn't live beyond the age of 14. He died from tuberculosis. Bernice, however, her daughter, she survived and is still alive today, a hundred years old. Shout out to Bernice. <laughs> I'm sure she's listening. <laughs> anyway, this was a few years before Gladys would become pregnant again. And she falls pregnant, this time with a girl. Norma. Now, Norma's name, oh, so much gets made of this. So the name Mortensen came from one of her ex-husbands who Gladys hadn't seen in years. I guess maybe it was like an old time value that children had to have the surname of a male figure. I, I'm guessing that's what it was. Even if that man had nothing to do with her and he had nothing to do with this baby. Um, her actual father, Norma's actual father, um, is believed to be a man called Charles Stanley Gifford. That is a right old timely name, isn't it? Hello, my name's Charles Stanley Gifford. What can I do for you? <laughs> That's what I think he sounds like. Now, Charles, he had been seeing Gladys behind his wife's back, naughty naughty, and when Gladys fell pregnant, he vanished. Classy. Classy move, Charles. What a dickhead. So, Gladys was alone and pregnant with Norma, and she's working, like, two jobs at this time, living in a tiny apartment in Los Angeles, just trying to make ends meet when she gives birth. So she's got a really hard time in her hands here because she's trying to juggle a baby, she's trying to work, and so what she does is she reaches out to the church who offer her some help. They point her in the direction of a couple who live in the next town over, and for the first six months of Norma's life, her mother and her live with this couple who help to raise the baby and look after Gladys. But there comes a time when, of course, Gladys has to go back to work. And so she goes back to the cutting business 
And actually, she only gets to see her baby daughter on the weekends because she's generally working 15, 16 hour day shifts and staying with friends. So what that means for Norma is that for the first year and a half, really, of her life, she's only partially seeing her mother and otherwise she's growing up with another family. And that would really stay the situation for years until 1933 when Norma would have been seven by that point. Gladys has saved a little bit of money. She buys a tiny little house in Hollywood for her and her daughter but the house turns out to be way more expensive than she thought it was going to be. Now, what she does is she picks up extra shifts in the film studios, but eventually that's not really enough to cover the rent. So what she does is she starts renting out her room to boarders who need somewhere to stay in Hollywood. And her and Norma would sleep on the couch. This was a disaster, this move by Gladys. I mean, I know she didn't really have much of a choice otherwise, but it is a disaster because what it really means is it's a house full of strangers constantly kind of coming and going and new people. It's just a really unsettled home. But like I say, she's doing her best to try and juggle the house, juggle her finances. And how does Gladys get described? Well, she gets talked about as cold. It said that she would often tell Norma, who was age seven, age eight, to be quiet. Stop making so much noise all the time. She moaned that Norma was such a noisy girl who needed constant attention. Honestly, she just went on and on and it just oh, it got to Gladys. Now, what it didn't really stop was, it didn't stop Norma from developing a really good imagination. She was inventive. She would create sort of little fantasy worlds for herself for hours in these little fantasies that she created. It's not exactly a great childhood, but there is, there is at least some semblance of, a, you know, a mother, an attempt at a family. But that is all about to change. At age eight, only now a year into their little Hollywood home, Gladys just can't cope. She can't cope anymore with the financial pressure. She also can't cope with her own mental health battle that she's been having since she was a teenager. She has a complete mental breakdown. She's taken to a hospital and she's diagnosed with schizophrenia. And the hospital at this point, they decide Gladys wasn't really going to go anywhere anytime soon. She could very well be a danger to herself or to others and so it was a good idea to keep Gladys in a hospital. And that meant that Norma, age 8, became a ward of the state. Now this is all really well documented so I won't overgild the lily, <laughs> as they say. But until about the age of 14, Norma gets bounced about from home to home orphanage to foster home sometimes for a couple of weeks in one home and then back to the orphanage back and forth back and forth she has no fixed place to live some of my foster families used to send me to the movies to get me out of the house and there I'd sit all day and way into the night when I was 11 the whole world was closed to me even the girls paid little attention to me because they thought, hmm, she's to be dealt with. When I was five, I think, that's when I started wanting to be an actress. I loved to play. I didn't like the world around me because it was kind of grim, but I loved to play house. It was like you could make your own boundaries. It goes beyond house. You could make your own situations and you could pretend and even if the other kids were a little slow on the imagining part, you could say, hey, what about if you were such and such and I were such and such, wouldn't that be fun? And they'd say, oh yes. And then I'd say, well, that will be a horse and this will be, it was play, playfulness. When I heard that this was acting, I said, that's what I want to be. You can play. But then you grow up 
and find out about playing, and they make playing very difficult for you. I think there's two things in human beings that I have in myself. They want to be alone, but they also want to be together. There is something in people where they need solitude for a while. Now, one person who does reach out and tries to help is a woman called Grace Goddard. Gracie Baby. She is one of the shining lights in the story. She'd been a friend of Gladys's for a long time and she takes pity on Norma. And what she would do is she would go to the orphanage, she would get Norma out of the orphanage, bring her to her own home, raise her with her own family, but only as long as they could afford it. Because there were mouths to feed in Grace's own family and when the bills were particularly tight that month and they couldn't quite afford it, the thing they had to cut loose was Norma. So she would go back to the orphanage for a short period of time. So, I mean, I suppose it's interesting, during all of this time, there's there's a sort of 13-year-old, 14-year-old Norma. And she's just become accustomed to the fact that she doesn't really have a fixed home. And it's difficult because she, she can't really attach to anything for too long and she kind of just becomes accustomed to the fact that she's not really going to be part of a family for a very long time or she's not really going to be in this particular orphanage for more than a couple of months at a time. So there's no point really feeling like she needs to get settled. But there is something developing in her which is quite interesting, and that's an awareness of herself. There's a real awareness of the fact that she's just like a lot of other girls in the orphanage and and boys who don't have parents that can look after them. But there's something else. And that's, that's her looks. She's aware that she looks a bit different from the other girls for want of a nicer way to put it, she's more attractive. And she's starting to develop this. And what's really interesting is, I said this thing about this last interview that she gave, and you'll hear lots of bits from it as we go through the story. But there's a really interesting moment I wanted to just point, point your attention to, where she's talking about her youth, and she sort of connects the dots a little bit with her 14-year-old self. All the newspaper boys, when they delivered the paper, would come around to where I lived, and I used to hang from the limb of a tree, and I had sort of a sweatshirt on. I didn't realize the value of a sweatshirt in those days, and then I was sort of beginning to catch on, but I didn't really quite get it because I couldn't really afford sweaters. But here they come with their bicycles, you know, and I'd get these free papers, and the family liked that. And they'd all pull their bicycles up around the tree, and then I'd be hanging, looking like a monkey, I guess. I was a little shy to come down. The family that she means in that clip is, I guess, whatever family she was with at the time. Norma gets a lot of free stuff because she's gorgeous. And, you know, by about age 15, she is really developing into a beauty. I mean, it's much like how it happened for me. (laughs) I'm kidding. (laughs) I mean, no, I'm not really kidding. It's actually how it happened, yeah. Except I wasn't really wearing, like, tight sweaters and hanging off trees... I mean, I was probably up to something else. I was probably making up dance routines. Not for the neighbourhood boys, I might add. (laughs) As a teenager, she sort of had, like, fleeting friends here and there. No one really stuck around for, for sort of long enough. It's also well documented that during this period of her life, somewhere between the ages of 7 and 15, she had been subject to quite a lot of abuse by various men who had entered her life 
perhaps for short periods of time when she was in the orphanage or perhaps when she was in foster homes. She would tell a doctor years later that at one point, living with her mother when they were renting out rooms, she had told her mum that one of the men had been touching her and her mother said, it's a real shame that that's happened to you, but we can't afford to kick these men out. Now, all the homes and places that she gets placed in, they're all kind of within, like, a reachable distance of her high school, which is Van Nuys High School in Los Angeles. Other notable people who went to that high school include Robert Redford, Jane Russell, the actress who she'd work with later, Natalie Wood, and Paula Abdul. <laughs> Fam famed for... What? Well, hang on. What's what's Paula Abdul famous for? <laughs> Singing some rubbish songs in the eighties. <laughs> Being Paula Abdul, I guess that's about it. Now, Grace, Grace, she did go through a formal adoption process for Norma, but it took a long, long time. It wasn't speedy, and during the time, she had to leave Norma in a care home while the paperwork was done. And eventually it was done and Norma was adopted by Grace's family. Brilliant. Okay, so here she is. She's finally going to be a part of something and then some really bad news arrives. Grace and her family are moving to West Virginia because her husband has a new job. And under the current law, they can't take Norma with them. She would have to stay in Los Angeles. So they create a plan and the plan is this. Marry her off. <laughs> Marry her to the guy next door. Literally. <laughs> Not the guy next door as in, oh, he's the boy next door. He's quite wholesome and ordinary, yet quite sexy. I mean the actual guy next door. <laughs> Do you think they just literally went out into the street and they were like, ah, bollocks, right? Um, oh, God, well, we can't take her with us. What we'll do? Um, right, okay, let's get in the neighbourhood and we'll just knock on some doors. First house they get to. Ah, brilliant, you'll do. Excellent. So she marries the next door neighbour, 21-year-old Jim Doherty. And she doesn't particularly want to do this, but at the age of 16, it's this, or go back to an orphanage. And that's not what she wants. So she marries him. She moves in with him and his parents. And now, being married, she's considered a legal adult. So she takes a job at the local munitions factory. She makes a few friends at the factory. Um, she has, you know, a, a fairly nice sort of social life with those people. She's living in Jim's family home. Did she want to be another factory worker? No. She had dreams of so, so much more. And what kind of fueled that was those around her, her co-workers, her friends would say, you know, Norma, you should be a model. You are gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. I mean, honestly, if I've had one person say that to me in my life, I've had a million. <laughs> and so it sort of puts the seed of something in her mind. Norma hated being married. Her husband, Jim, was overseas and kind of through his parents and through letters, he keeps a close eye on her from afar. And he doesn't enjoy the fact that she's got freedom and a job. He thinks she should be at home looking after the house, learning housewife skills. But she wanted so much more. So one day... A photographer comes to the factory, goes to take photographs of the munitions girls. He spots Norma and he says, you should really think about modelling. And at this point, it's, it's the look we've all seen. We've seen it a million times. It's the 16 or 17 year old with the brunette curls. She's got the slightly baby face. She's usually wearing like a plaid dress kind of thing, hair and pigtails sometimes. And she jumps at the chance. 
to join an agency. So she gets the number for an agency from the photographer. She calls, they ask to see her, and immediately they sign her. And she's 17 years old when she's taken on by her first modelling agency. She would, at this time, appear on the cover of 30 different magazines in the one year. Some of them were <coughs> men's magazines. Oi oi. <laughs> Others were adverts for, like, various female products. <laughs> Look, there's an attractive girl with a hoover. Don't you want to buy it? <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, by the way, I'll just tell you this. If you had... Not, not that I suspect any of you do, but <laughs> if you had one of those original covers from that time period, you would be a millionaire. You would make a mint. People who ha found those in old attics that their great-grandparents had kept went on to earn millions out of those early magazine covers that she did. So, Norma quits her job. She quits it because she now is full-time modelling. She stays married for a few years, but at age 20, she gets a divorce. You see, Jim is not too happy about this modelling malarkey. He didn't like it one little bit, but she did. So she leaves him. She rents a cheap room and starts saving up her money from her modelling work. So interesting, I think, that if you if you sort of look at it like her way to independence out of years of people sort of putting her in places, telling her where to be. I mean, up until this point, everybody has kind of moved her into different positions. And the first bit of freedom that she gets comes from her looks. It just comes from what she looks like. And it's interesting because I think it's now that she starts to take a bit of control of that. She starts to go, hmm, I'm in possession of the good looks and I can do something with it. But everyone will know Norma had eyes for something bigger. Something bigger than modelling. She wanted to be an actress. A darling of the silver screen. It's interesting that she's driven by that kind of, I want to be someone. I want to be known. Modelling was fine, but it was never quite enough. She wanted more. Norma was never going to be the cleaning woman. Norma was never going to be the girl people bossed around. Norma was never going to be just somebody's wife. And Norma was ready to do whatever that took. So here's what she does. She asks the modelling agency if they will get her a test screening at a film agency. It was pretty standard practice at the time. If you were a model, the natural sort of progression or next step was into film acting. So they do, and they get a screen test with only a, the biggest one in Hollywood, a bloody 20th century fox. Wow. Now, does it go well? No. <laughs> no, it does not. <laughs> the studio bosses think that, and I quote, she's dull and forgettable. One of them comments, it's hard to tell if she has any acting talent at all. Harsh. <laughs> Harsh words. However, the film studio game, it was a really competitive business. And in those days... You signed people for contracts. You kept them on contract, whether you used them or you didn't use them, or they occasionally got one line in a film somewhere or whatever. But what you didn't want to do was, if you had somebody quite attractive, you didn't want to lose them to another studio. And so they think, let's keep her, let's sign her for six months, just so another agency doesn't take her on. Now, she's delighted. She's absolutely thrilled. And... Out of this contract, she gets a meeting with the head of the studio, who says this to her. Hollywood isn't doing brunettes anymore. Cut it and dye it blonde. And if you're serious about acting, change your name. He says to her, seriously, Doherty. 
Doherty? Doherty? I mean, it's it's so confusing. People will not know how to say that name. Get rid of it. Pick something else. So she does. She picks Jean Norman. No. <laughs> no, say the studio. You sound like a housewife. It's ridiculous. Get rid of it. Okay. So she comes back with Norma Jean Baker. No, they say it's it's clunky. It's it's not very pleasant. They say to her, how about the name Monroe? Surname Monroe. It's classy. She says, all right, okay. Now we just need to come up with a first name. So they give her a first name. She agrees to it. And two days later, she writes a letter to Grace, the woman who had adopted her, and it reads as follows. I'm going to be called Meredith Monroe. How exciting. So if you see me in the newspapers, you might not recognize me. I'm blonde now and my hair is shorter. Look out for me. Love, Meredith. I'll always be Norma to you. The studio bosses quickly decide they actually hate the name Meredith, even though they had suggested it. And they suggest Marilyn. She likes it. They like it. Finally, finally, a fucking name they can all agree on. Okay, new name, new hair. A little bit of cosmetic surgery, some work on her nose, a little work on her chin. And she's ready. I say she's ready, but she's ready and she's kind of one of many. She's one of dozens of actresses all wanting a couple of lines in any film that's being shot. If I was one of those (laughs) really cheesy, cheesy podcasts, I'd say something like, Norma left the munitions factory because she didn't want to just be another person in a factory. And here she was, stepping into Hollywood, where she was just another person in the factory. Oh, (laughs) I just kind of said it, didn't I? (laughs) I realised it. I was trying to take the piss out of cheesy podcasts and actually unintentionally said something really cheesy. Anyway, you get the point. So... She starts taking acting classes, but there are issues. Shyness. Hard to believe, I know, given what we see of her later in life, but shyness dominated her life. And her first few roles that she gets, like the maid or the waitress, well, they're difficult because nerves get in the way and... This shyness really comes out of her, and she's not great. I mean, even if she's got one line as the waitress, oh, what can I get you, or can I take your order? She's so petrified in front of the cameras that it shows, and they have to stop, get her to do it again, try it again, relax, don't look so scared. It's... It's not great. It's, it's 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 not a great start. She can't she can't get through one line in a film. There's not really much hope for this girl. Also, struggle with shyness is in every actor, more than anyone can imagine. There's a sensor inside us that says, "To what degree do we let go?" Like a child playing. I guess people think we just go out there and you know that's all we do. Just do it. But it's a real struggle. I'm one of the world's most self-conscious people. I really do have to struggle. So what they do is they send her for acting classes. They say to her, right, go and take some theatre roles. Even if they're small, get out there in front of a live audience. Get used to performing in front of people. And she does it. She tries. And she works really hard to try and overcome the nerves. I wonder what she's so petrified of. Is it getting it wrong? Is she so petrified that she might not work and can't afford to eat? Or, I don't know. My guess, and it's only a guess, is actually that this sort of step into filming, it's the real desire, isn't it, for her to move beyond her looks. It's the it's the want to prove to the world that she could act, that, that she was more than just boobs and a bum and a pretty face. 
unfortunately, every single time she got up to act, she looked like a rabbit caught in the headlights. So after six months the studio, they don't renew her contract. This Marilyn Monroe girl, she's not up to much. They can't really see a future. Yeah, she looked nice. Yeah, she did. But so did plenty of other girls on the contract. And the difference was, they could act. Now, it's not a complete disaster. It's not a total disaster at this point because she keeps up the acting classes and she networks. She gets herself to parties where she meets studio bosses. She meets lots of the sort of right kind of people and when she's trying to be seen at parties, someone from Columbia Pictures sees her and signs her on for a film called Ladies of the Chorus. She makes this film, still very nervous in front of the camera, but she has her acting coach with her when she's filming. And this, this really seems to help her get through what she needs to do in the scenes. So it's okay. I mean, her performance is okay. It's not earth shattering, but it's fine. Now what happens is this, the studio boss, he calls her into his office once filming is done on Ladies of the Chorus. And he asks her if she would like to go on an overnight trip with him, a, a short cruise. She says no. No. <laughs> this is not normal for the young actresses. They always said yes, and this Harvey Weinstein in the making is appalled, absolutely appalled, that she has turned him down. And as she's leaving, he screams at her, just who the hell do you think you are? The next day, he has her fired from her second Hollywood studio. So, the only thing she can do now is return to modelling. And now it's around about this time, that the real Hollywood machine kicks up a notch. Through more modelling, she meets a man connected to the William Morris Agency. It's a huge talent agency. And it represents some of the biggest people in Hollywood. And if she can get them to represent her, then she can go on and do lots of different things. She can get herself involved in all manner of different projects. At this time, the William Morris Agency uh, were representing people like Charlie Chaplin, the Marx Brothers, Mae West. Musically, they would go on later <laughs> to represent Sonny and Cher. I got you, babe. The Beach Boys, the Rolling Stones, I mean, huge, right? We're talking massive. So Marilyn, she begins with them and they do really well by her to start with. They get her a minor role in the film All About Eve, a classic. And with each film role, she starts to get a little less nervous about acting. She starts to improve as an actress. I mean, a little side story here because we will come on to talk about the many men that she leaves in her wake but Johnny Hyde he's the man who gets her involved in this agency well he at the time was 32 years older than her he was married and he was completely head over heels in love with her she however was not in love with him he left his wife for Marilyn even though they weren't a couple and he proposed to her many, many times. She always said no. He stayed on as her agent. He stayed on as the man who was supporting her and getting her into projects. But she would just never accept that marriage proposal. He begged her and he begged her for marriage and she just kept saying no. What he did for her was he went to the studios and he negotiated with the ones that had fired her to give her a new contract. And he was quite a big deal. So when he was going to these studios, they were saying, well, you know, if he can see something in her, if he can see something, maybe we've missed it. Maybe there is a talent in her. I mean, we can't see it really, but okay, we'll give her another go. And she gets signed again. So 
this is good and she starts to get more and more film roles she starts to get more and more press attention things are going upwards for her this is good but then that's all going to come to an abrupt halt this man johnny her cheerleader her biggest fan dies suddenly of a heart attack and just like that gone is the one person in hollywood who really believes in her her own personal cheerleader is out of the picture what this sparks is marilyn's first suicide attempt she's 24 years old in her small hollywood apartment she takes an overdose of sleeping pills mixed with vodka and if it wasn't for her acting coach who dropped by that evening to pass some scripts to her for an acting class then i wouldn't be telling this story she gets rushed to the hospital and her stomach is pumped for the first time at the age of 24 she enters into a dialogue with a psychiatrist and what's so interesting is that she's really taken aback by her own mental health. The psychiatrist who saw her at the time will say it's so odd. She couldn't see or understand that she'd grown up around mental health. She'd grown up around these problems. And okay, this is where it can get slippery and tricky. I know this is contentious and I know that people will argue to death that mental health is or isn't hereditary, but I'm just saying that in 1948, the school of thought was that it was linked to your parents and other family members. Now, don't come at me because I'm not well versed enough to know the ins and the outs of that, but I think what we can focus on is that Marilyn Monroe's mother and grandmother were both in psychiatric facilities long term and yet here she is at 24 shocked by her own feelings shocked when a doctor tells her that she suffers from anxiety and depression she doesn't see it she doesn't understand it she feels it but she's not quite made that connection between other members of her family and herself I mean, that's scary, isn't it? When you think now, right, I mean, and this is just tragic, when you think now that eight and nine-year-olds can literally diagnose themselves with depression, it's just so strange that she was 24 and surprised by it. She recovers slowly from the suicide attempt and it's now that she starts to really focus on what she wants and, well, what she wants and what she doesn't want. And she's very clear. She wants to be taken seriously as an actress. She wants people to think of her as an intelligent woman. I'm not just generally happy. If I'm generally anything, I guess I'm generally miserable. I was never used to being happy, so that wasn't something I ever took for granted. You see, I was brought up differently from the average American child. Because the average child is brought up expecting to be happy. She doesn't want to be this sexy woman on screen with her boobs out. She tries really hard to battle that. She'd talk to the studio bosses and she'd say to them you must stop casting me as the token sexy girl i'm so much more than that and we're going to see that actually that's a battle that she has ahead of her for the next 12 years of her life this need to be seen as intelligent she reads books she reads plays she reads the newspapers and she tries to understand politics both international and American. She's determined this Marilyn Monroe that she was becoming. She wasn't going to be a bimbo. She wasn't going to be just another piece of S on a screen. But here's the thing. If she wanted fame, if she wanted to pay the rent, 
this blonde sexy thing, that's where the money was going to be made. Now she resigned herself to that slightly and she entered into a year which would really change her life. This is where everything goes up to the next level. There's two very important things happen in 1954. First thing to note, I think that's interesting, is she isn't quite Marilyn Monroe yet. Well, I mean, she is and she isn't. She's she's playing in lots of films and she's playing a real range of roles. Sometimes she's the love interest. There's films in which she plays a psychotic babysitter, sort of early hand that rocks the cradle vibes. Uh, <laughs> And she's working with people like Cary Grant, you know, big actors, and she's making an impact. She's getting favourable reviews, and actually she starts to prove she can do a multitude of roles quite well. She can act. Although, what's coming with that is the difficulty of having to have her acting coach on set with her at all times. And it's, it's causing real issues. As we know, on a film set, the director is the king or the queen. And in the case of Marilyn Monroe, she would do a take and then she would confer with her acting coach about her performance. The directors would be furious. If they tried to direct her, she would often get defensive and stroppy and sometimes claim to not understand what they meant or what they wanted her to do. What it led to was massive delays on set. Other actors were now starting to get really fucking annoyed about how slow she made the process. So you've got this kind of dual thing going on. On the one hand, the public are seeing this rising star, this beautiful young actress who's doing all these great film roles and she's still modelling and yet to work with drama. <laughs> Her male co-stars objected to how much of a diva, as they called her, she was becoming. But it's so interesting because I don't know that that's how she saw herself. I don't think she saw herself as a diva. She just, she saw herself as someone who needed time before she could perform. If you wanted something out of her, you had to give her time. She was shy. She was anxious. Major anxiety attacks would sometimes stop her from walking into the studio. She'd sit outside of the studio for hours before someone finally came out, got her and led her by the hand inside. I've always felt towards the slightest scene, even if all I had to do in a scene was just to come in and say, hi, that the people ought to get their money's worth and that this is an obligation of mine to give them the best you can get from me. So, in this time period, how how did we deal with anxiety and low self-esteem? Pills, of course. Pills and liquor. She starts a daily mix of alcohol and tranquilizers to calm her down and get rid of those nerves. She's still seeing her therapist. So at this point, there's a lot of people who've got their hands in the Marilyn Monroe rise to stardom, but at this point, you know, she's still in control. And for anyone who, you know, might think that she lived entirely as a victim, I think at the end of 1953, she proves she knows what she's doing. She knows how to get her name out there. A scandal. That's what'll do it. You want people to talk about you, be scandalous. And so, I mean, this is so minor what she does. So minor compared to what we get these days. She gives an interview to The Hollywood Reporter in which she states that she often doesn't wear underwear under her clothing. Hang on, that's a ridiculous sentence. Of course she doesn't wear underwear under her clothing. Why would she wear it out of her clothing? She's not bloody Superman. Anyway, you, you get what I mean. <laughs> she reveals that she once posed nude for photographs because she was so poor she couldn't eat. I mean, in the days where, like, right now we have literally all seen 
Kim Kardashian's lady bits on the internet. <laughs> it doesn't seem that shocking, but it was. The papers went wild with this and, you know, fluttering her eyelids at the at the reporter and being breathy and really coy about it. What she manages to do is turn the nude photo comment into this moment of weakness where, you know, she was so vulnerable that she had to do it. Nobody could save her. She had to take those photographs if she wanted to survive. And this, this right here is her skill. This is the skill. She is brilliant at saying exactly what she needs to say and playing the victim and being so innocent all at the same time. And so she gets hailed as the girl who took off her clothes because she was so poor she couldn't afford to eat. And now look at her, she's turning into a starlet of the screen. And the public love her for it. Women supported her. Female fans hailed her as incredibly strong for standing up and, and admitting that she had done these nude images. And the men too. What did the men do? Well, <laughs> I'm guessing they maybe tried to find those nude images. Know what I'm saying? <laughs> Hollywood actresses, her peers, they, they weren't so impressed. In general, they weren't impressed with her overall. They called her vulgar unbecoming and whatever the 1953 version of media hungry was and difficult also she was difficult to other actresses often they described her as closed off distanced and they read this as she was above her station some will say that's so not true she was never above herself Never. She was so insecure that she would have hated to believe that these actresses thought that, that she thought she was better than them. She knew her place. And yet, some who work with her, they will say very differently. I don't know. Is it maybe that people just hated the fact that she was getting really good at the fame game? And then 1954 arrives, and this was it. This was it. The early modelling, the acting classes and the coaches, the changes from Norma to Marilyn, the parties, the press, it all paid off. Because in that one year, she would make two films which would send her stardom through the roof. After you get what you want, you don't want what you wanted at all. I know. I know. The first film in that year was Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, a classic. And secondly, How to Marry a Millionaire. So she was no longer the bit part. She was the star of the movies. The studios put faith in her name to sell the tickets. It's so fascinating because, uh, how many times have I said the word fascinating in this fucking episode so far? Oh my god, stop saying the word fascinating. It's fascinating because they did this so publicly, made her this, you know, name, and yet that's so not how she was treated in the studios. In this last interview, she talks about the first time she saw her name in big letters outside of a cinema. The time I sort of began to think I was famous, I was driving somebody to the airport, and as I came back, there was this movie house, and I saw my name in lights. I pulled the car up at a distance down the street. It was too much to take up close, you know, all of a sudden. And I said, God, somebody's made a mistake. But there it was in lights. And I sat there and said, so that's the way it looks. And it was all very strange to me. And yet at the studio they had said, remember, you're not a star. And by now she's stretching herself into singing 
and we get songs such as Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend, Bye Bye Baby. And it's in that same year she would make the film There's No Business Like Show Business, which contains, by the way, I think, the best Marilyn Monroe song she ever did. It's called After You Get What You Want, You Don't Want It At All. A snappy title, I think you'll agree. <laughs> but I think it's great, and if you have a second, watch the YouTube version from the film of her doing this song. It's it's brilliant. She's brilliant in it. I mean, if you if you rewatch, in fact, any of these performances of the time, Diamonds are a girl's best friend, she's perfect. I mean, she looks incredible. Although, I'll tell you this, this is totally off... <laughs> Not off topic, but it's just a little side note. If you watch Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend, right? <laughs> there is one dancer in it who does my bloody head in. <laughs> right. So when you watch it, right, if you if you can if you have seen it, go back in your mind and if you haven't seen it, go and watch it. There's a bit at the beginning, right? She's got the fan and she's doing the no 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 and she's slapping them all with the, the fan and she's in the pink dress and these male dancers are round about her, right? And there's one who's on her right hand side. Yeah, so you're looking at him, yeah, he's on the left of the screen. Um he's got like sort of grey at the side of his hair, a bit of grey in the front. And there's a bit at the beginning. <laughs> She does this thing with a fan, and all the men raise a heart all at the same time. I don't know, a little heart on cardboard or whatever it is. Well, this guy, he's a second late with the heart, and it does my head in, right? <laughs> he's just a beat behind everyone else. Anyway, you're not supposed to focus on him. You're supposed to be looking at Marlon Monroe, but I can't help but notice. Oh, my God, he's completely out of time, right? So I let that annoyance go. Then about 10 seconds later, they all drop the hearts at the same time. Except for Sloey McSloison, who's again a beat behind everyone else, right? So this really annoys me. Then it gets to the bit in Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend, where she sort of runs down the middle of the audience catwalky bit, and all the men raise their diamonds at the same time. And here he is again. <laughs> a beat behind everyone else. This dancer should have been fired. If Honestly, if I was the director at the time, I would have just been like, look, mate, you are a, you are a second behind Every other dancer in this place, get off my get off my set. <laughs> Find somebody else. Okay, so these performances, they are brilliant, but did they come easily? I mean, yeah, they are great to watch, but they came at a cost. A major cost to the studios and to the crew and to the band. Because it took so, so long to get these things. It took so long to get them right. She would hide in her dressing room, which was actually a toilet, and she wouldn't come out because she was scared. She wasn't ready to sing. She was nervous to perform. And so the studio developed behind her back, and she wouldn't know about this for years to come. They developed something called the Madam's Schedule. And that was the schedule that they had separate to the main schedule and it was called this because they called her the Madam. They wanted to work off of a different schedule for the days, the times, the moments when she wasn't ready to come on set. It was a way of the studio not losing lots of money. What it meant they could do is they could do everything completely out of sequence. So if she wasn't ready to come on set that day, what they would do is they would go, right, let's get whoever's available acting wise and we'll do the final scene from the thing, the one that she's not in, or we'll do this moment here, or, you know, and at a moment's notice, these actors would have to be ready to work on any bit of the film, because if Marilyn wasn't ready to film her scenes, they just weren't being filmed that day. And it just caused tension. Other actors hated turning up for a day's filming with her, because they never knew if it was gonna be a normal filming day, or a 15 hour shoot where you waited for her to come on set. They didn't know if she was going to arrive and know her lines or not know her lines. Now at this point, I mean, I have to apologise if you are a major Marilyn Monroe fan, but let's put it into perspective. She was just another actress. She was just another actress who could sing, who could dance, who looked good. Or was she? Was she just another actress? No, maybe not. 
Was she ever just in another anything in her life? Is that why she's so famous? Is that why there's still an obsession with her? I mean, all right, the studios are thinking, yeah, she's popular with the public, but I think we need to fire her. I think we need to get rid of her. She's causing major issues. But they can't. They actually can't because she's bringing in the big bucks. She's raking in millions per film. People are queuing down the street for hours to get into cinemas and watch her perform. I'd said earlier that other actors and actresses were having issues with her, but there were a few nice stories around the time of how people like Jane Russell used to go into her dressing room, stroke toilet, and take her by the arm, walk her onto set, help her get ready to film. And I, you know, I hope that that came from the good nature of people who wanted her to do well and not that they had been sent there by the studio bosses to basically get her onto the set. I suppose if you think about what we kind of know of her thought process so far, why maybe things were difficult for her, she still wanted to really be taken seriously and she's still playing the dumb blonde. And it was difficult. And it was going to be made more difficult by the fact that 1954, when she made those films, the phrase blonde bombshell was first used in the newspapers and it would become her name until she died eight years later. It's well documented and I'll not dwell on it, but she was paid way, way less than everybody else in a film. She didn't get her own dressing rooms and when she complained about it, she was ignored. I mean, she said famously in so many interviews, I was mistreated in so many films. I couldn't understand it. The film was called Gentlemen Prefer Blondes and I was the blonde. It was at this time the studios developed a phrase that they would say to her often, which is this. Remember, you're not a star. I mean, it's so conflicting. You can, you can kind of see why that would, that would cause her problems. Because on the one hand, she can't go down the street without being mobbed by people. And yet the treatment that she's actually receiving when she goes to work is, is awful. Now, she pulls her next move here. She pulls her next, I know what will get me even more famous at this point, which she's really good at doing. She marries Joe DiMaggio, the biggest baseball star in the world at the time. And it's a calculated move. The studio has just suspended her. Why? Well, because she's refusing to turn up on set to film what they're casting her in. And they'd had enough. This diva was dead in the water, as far as they were concerned. But they slightly underestimated the power of Marilyn Monroe. On the day that she was going to marry Joe DiMaggio in a registry office in Los Angeles, a very intimate private wedding, she calls the press herself an hour before the wedding. <laughs> she places an anonymous call saying, you're never going to believe it, Marilyn Monroe is marrying Joe DiMaggio in a secret ceremony. She gives him the address. And when she emerges from that small, tiny wedding, the streets are at a complete standstill. Thousands of people have gathered to see her emerge. The press are everywhere. And she does the best acting of her life to look shocked when, in fact, she was the one who had called them. She's excellent at the game. Now, although the studio are not playing ball, they do see that this marriage is getting her a lot of headlines. But it's not enough to invite her back. So, in fact, she's going to do something even bigger. It's while she's on honeymoon with Joe in Japan that she tells him she's going to travel quietly to Korea and she's going to perform for the troops. She digs out a sexy dress. And against Joe's wishes, because he is really not into this plan, she goes and she performs. You'll have seen the images a million times. Thousands of men, thousands of soldiers applauding and cheering as she stands on stage looking incredible, singing Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend. It makes headlines around the world. And of course, what happens is Marilyn comes out of it looking like a hero. She just cut short her honeymoon to entertain the troops overseas. Wasn't she just the best American? 
so patriotic. And in that one move, she'd gone from being the biggest Hollywood actress to being a symbol of America. Glamour. Sex. And didn't she just have the biggest heart? She was a dream come true. If she wasn't real, you'd think she'd been invented. I don't think I realized I could affect people until I went to Korea. I guess these men looked at me like they wanted to see if I was real. They wanted something different from their everyday life. I guess we might call that entertainment. And she knew what was coming from that appearance. She knew it. And the next day it happened. A phone call from the studio. They asked her back. They gave her a new contract. The ban was lifted. And now she had more power than ever. She bargained with them that if they wanted her back, she had some terms. She wanted control over her scripts, her roles, her director, and her fellow actors. Pretty big demands, but they agree. And it's now that she goes on to film The Seven Year Itch. And this is, of course, where we get the really iconic image that will forever be seen. The iconic image of the dress blowing up. Also, she makes some seriously sexy money out of this film, and the studios do too. But does it all mean that everything is forgiven and forgotten with her behaviour? No. Billy Wilder, the director of The Seven Year Itch, says at the end of it, I can't work with her again. She is impossible. She doesn't show up for days. You can't ever find her. She's costing us millions in rescheduling. But where was she in the days where no one could reach her? Well, she was at home or she was in her therapist's office. If she was at home, the curtains were drawn and she didn't want to talk to anyone. I suppose in her story, it's this moment here, it, it makes me kind of mad because there's so many people around her. But nobody's really stopping her from taking sleeping pills and missing days of filming. And I know you can't force someone who's unwell to do things, but it just doesn't feel like she was getting the right help. And she certainly wasn't. Psychologists now who look back at the notes and the medications that she was given, they'll say, if this was now, Norma would have been diagnosed with paranoia, depression and borderline personality disorder. And depending on who you listen to and how much you trust their opinion, some doctors will say that it's likely that nowadays she would probably be in a program of regular visits to a psychiatric facility. She'd most certainly be on antidepressants and she'd be having a daily meeting with a psychologist. So this seven year itch photo, it gets taken, the dress up in the air, at the premiere, this photo, you know, she restages that moment for the premiere. She stands over the grate, wind goes up, blah, blah, blah. And Joe is in the crowd watching this and he hates it. He hates the cavorting. Oh, good word. Good word, cavorting. <laughs> and after 10 months, 10 months of being married, the marriage comes to an end. It's well known that her 10 month marriage to Joe was a disaster. He was known to be controlling. He hated this sex symbol status. He wanted her to be more of a housewife than a figure for other people to desire. But it's a bit too late, Joe. I'm afraid she's already there. Also, that kind of surprises me because I'm like, who did you think you were marrying then? Like, if you wanted a housewife, why why did you marry Marilyn Monroe? Like, what? What did you think she was going to do? Get married and go, oh, well, I'll tell you what, mm, yeah, I'll just put all that behind me. N no, idiot. During, during their marriage, things like her fan mail would go missing because Joe had instructed that it be sent to a private mailbox that only he could access. He didn't want her seeing fan mail. She got enough attention. She didn't need more of it. It was just giving her an ego. 
Sorry to say it, Joe, but I think the eagle was already there. I think it was. What I didn't know when I started researching is that Joe DiMaggio had a son. He had a ten-year-old son, imaginatively called Joe DiMaggio Jr. <laughs> so for ten months, this boy had Marilyn Monroe as his mother figure. Well, actually, for much, much longer, because he stays in her life. Now, this marriage ending would be the second marriage ending for Marilyn. And her and Joe, they divorce on the grounds that he is a cruel husband. That's exactly what his first marriage ended with as well. I see a pattern emerging. A lot of blame gets put at Joe's door for the next few years of her life. The the idea sort of exists that he had really dented her self-esteem. He, you know, really made her question who she was and she wouldn't ever really talk much about Joe DiMaggio. He would live on for years and years and he would show regret about his treatment of her years later. This is so strange, but he would buy lots of memorabilia, spend millions years later on memorabilia of her. In fact, he paid thousands to have a life-size doll version of her made for his home. This is like when he was much, much older. It's weird, isn't it? Weird when you think that he actually had her as his wife and he treated her like a bastard. And then years later, went on to collect things about her as if she was this strange, iconic figure he'd never met. When Joe DiMaggio died from a heart attack years later... His last words were, at least I'll get to see Marilyn again. So here we are at this question, why is she so famous? Why do I, who doesn't really know a great deal about her, find her so interesting? I'm still not sure. I think it's what she does next that might play a massive, massive part in it. She goes on a whirlwind series of affairs and uh, for the girl who thinks that she is in control, that she's the one pulling the strings, that's about to change when she messes with politics and begins to tangle with the wrong people. And so ends part one of the story. I have always had a pride in the fact that I was my own. My Who own. the hell does she think she is? Marilyn Monroe? Who the hell does she think she is? I have always had a pride, had a pride, had a pride in the fact that... You're always wishing, wanting for something. When you get what you want, you don't want what you get. That I was my own. Pride in the You've fact got a that changeable I nature. I always, always, always changing your mind. There's a longing in your eye, hard to satisfy. And here is the reason why. After you get what you want, you don't want it. If I gave you the moon, you'd grow tired of it soon. You're like a baby. You want what you want when you want it. But after you are presented with what you want, you're discontented. I was my own. I was my own. Pride in the fact that I was my own. I have always had a pride in the fact.